Thank you very much. What a great morning of discussion. I learned so much, even though I've been intimately involved with the research that you heard um, uh, this morning. I'd like to thank all the speakers for the rich conversations. And I wanted to let you all know, because so many of you have asked me in the hallway, where did they come from? Well, they came from Charlottesville, Phoenix, Arizona, London, Madrid, Venice, in the case of Malcolm, Auckland, Seoul, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Manila, and Kaohsiung. Thank you very much, all of you are jet lagged and still awake to, uh, to be at our final panel. Our panelists have highlighted how the Asia Pacific region is sharing its successes, failures, and learnings across public health, economic dynamism, talent circulation, and sustainable growth. I think these conversations show that none of these challenges exist in the world in a vacuum. They transcend. I also like to thank our media partners, Bloomberg and Commonwealth for co-organizing this event with us, and especially Yi Shan Chen and Jennifer Creary for organizing the excellent and insightful panels. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our lunchtime conversation. Placing resilience at the heart of society, where we bring current Premier, Premier Chen Jianren together with our Advisory Council Chair, Malcolm Turnbull, a former Prime Minister of Australia, here with you today. We invited Premier Chen to speak at our annual forum today because his experience bridges the world of science and the world of policy. Prime Minister Chen has a doctorate in epidemiology and human genetics from Johns Hopkins University, and he dedicated himself to genomic and epidemiological research for over 40 years. He's an academician and distinguished research fellow of the Genomics Research Center at Academia Sinica here in Taipei. He's one of the pioneers in research on predicting risk of end-stage liver disease in people with chronic hepatitis B. You'll probably find pamphlets of his face all over health centers in Taiwan. He knows about community health and national policy. In 2021, he was appointed as an academician to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences by the Pope. Premier Chen's health and scientific background informed his experience in government. He was Taiwan's Minister of Health during the SARS pandemic in 2003, and he was Vice President when COVID-19 broke out in 2020. As part of the Reform for Resilience Commission, he has been advising Capri on its founding throughout 2021 and always believed in resilience as the center's mission. Since he took office as the Prime Minister, he has also made resilience the center of his administration's mission. Premier Chen's speech this afternoon will be followed by comments by Malcolm Turnbull. Returning to the stage, if you were not here this morning, please go to our YouTube and listen to his amazing speech. His speech will close out our forum as chair of Capri's International Advisory Council. Almost all of our council members are here. Um, and we have had the honor of hosting Malcolm twice this year in today's forum here and in Charlottesville, Virginia last month, where he and his wife, Lucy Turnbull, the Lord, uh, mayor of Sydney, joined Capri uh, council member Steve Mall, who's also here in conversation at the University of Virginia. Malcolm has been supportive of Capri's mission of enhancing resilience and promoting innovative policy through interdisciplinary research since its beginning. Today's closed conversation is a reunion of sorts for the three of us. Malcolm and I have known each other since 1997 when we were both, it's embarrassing to say, bankers. <laughs> and our families, including my husband, Harry Harding, have kept in touch personally and professionally with Malcolm and his family. As a political leader, he has focused on clean energy and resilience for Australia and the region, including saving the TPP, and creating the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. His biography, unfortunately, has not been translated into Chinese, partly because it is so thick, uh, but all of you can download it on Kindle to read his chapter about how to save the TPP. During the pandemic, we came together to create the Global Reform for Resilience Commission, which we founded in 2020, to make the COVID-19 pandemic a catalyst for reform, not a challenge, but an opportunity to improve resilience across health, economy, 
and environment. And along, commissions, along the way, commissions co-chairs Jose Manuel Barroso, chair of Gavi, and former president of the European Commission, who is also on our council, who unfortunately cannot be here today. Uh, we together invited Prime Minister C.J. Chen to join the commission. At that time, Professor Chen had returned to research full-time at Academia Sinica. Throughout the following year, our little team in Taipei here, including our supporters, early donors, made plans to establish an independent, non-governmental organization. Professor Chen supported and advised us until he re-entered politics at the end of 2021. We talked on a regular basis, and I know how deeply committed he is to societal resilience. Before turning the floor over to Premier Chen, I'd like to take a minute of your time to again thank our International Advisory Council, who volunteer to be on our council, and senior fellows who come from all these different countries that you heard today in the second and fourth panel, and guest speakers participating in our forum. We also like to thank our co-founders, having been involved in so many different partnerships now. The Partnership for Health System Sustainability and Resilience Project include partners uh, who are here today, AstraZeneca, Philips, KPMG, and the WHO Foundation, the World Economic Forum, and the London School of Economics. Our donors, our donors and board members who work, make Caprice work possible and Caprice staff for working tirelessly to put it all together, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Just now listening to Lynette Ng from TSMC, how she said that the Taiwanese have a problem of being over-talented and overworking. I have to say, I just like to change that statement to say people who are in Taiwan simply are over-committed and very passionate. We, as a very small team of 12, come from six countries. So what I like to edit is not just the Taiwanese. People who come to this island and stay here simply have something out of the ordinary. We have a very small staff of 12 people, four uh, in the UK and the United States, uh, but they come from six countries and they all overwork so much that I cannot follow them. And I thank you, you probably see them all over the place here. I thank you for joining us. You are part of us now, either in person or online, and I hope you'll continue to follow our work, help us, volunteer for us, intern for us in any way possible. Now I'd like to invite Prime Minister Chen up to the stage to tell us how we can place resilience at the heart of society, and we look forward to Malcolm's closing remarks afterwards. Thank you again for coming today. Chair of Cabri, Professor Lin, former Prime Minister of Australia, Mr. Tombo, distinguished guests, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And thank you for your introduction, Professor Lin. It is an absolute uh, honor for me to address this luncheon section of the Cabri 2023 annual forum. Cabri has a special status as the first international think tank uh, headquartered in Taiwan. It actively pursued its ambition to help Taiwan improve and build consensus among different voices. I have high expectation of the recent debate and pooling of wisdom by scholars and experts from diverse country at this summit. I am confident that this will generate substantive and forward-looking suggestion on creating a better future for Taiwan, a future that Taiwanese in all walks of life can feel to be worth looking forward to. Now, now that the COVID-19 pandemic is coming to an end and global supply chains are being reconfigured, countries throughout, sorry, Countries throughout the Asia Pacific are developing various strategies for seizing emerging opportunities amid the changing 
conditions of global economic competition. However, the challenges that have confronted us over recent years, part, particularly the US-China trade conflict, the once in a hundred years of pandemic, the Russian-Ukraine war, and the intensification of climate change impact have made evident just how vulnerable and helpless national economies and global supply chains are in the face of sudden extreme risks. Over, or moreover, these challenges go beyond border and are interdisciplinary so that no country has in, is in their power to confront them alone. We must all rely on working together with like-minded countries to adopt consistent and effective responses, as this is the only way to cope with them. As specific countries embark upon the post-pandemic reconstruction, CapRead has brought together to Taiwan internationally renowned scholars and experts to discuss the direction of strengthening national resilience in the region under the theme of Asian Pacific, a resilient phoenix rising from the pandemic. This forum is very timely and in significance and importance. I believe it will help us to enhance the international perspective of our country's policy making and at the same time serve as a reference for other Asian Pacific countries. Due to Taiwan's special geopolitical situation, our people have always lived by the motto, be prepared for danger in times of peace. Be prepared for danger in times of peace. The SARS pandemic in 2003 further strengthened our alertness to the risk of transnational infectious diseases. Since 2016, under the leadership of President Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our government has carried out a series of plans and actions to bolster our country's resilience, effectively enhancing the key role of Taiwan's industry in global supply chains. During the pandemic, Taiwan has displayed to the world the strengths of our economic and industrial resilience, we not only were one of the few countries in the world to maintain positive economic growth in 2020, but even achieve an 11-year high growth rate of 6.5% in 2021. Our labor market also remained relatively stable throughout that time, with no significant increase in unemployment rate. Since the beginning of this year, we have had to contained with a global economic slowdown along with many persisting uncertainties in the international political and economic environment. In order to reduce the adverse impact of external shocks on our economy and society, the government secured the passage of a special legislation to boost economic and social resilience and share the proceeds of growth in the post-pandemic era. Besides the distribution of a cash handout of $6,080 to every man, woman, and child as a means of ensuring that the fruits of economic growth are shared with the entire population, this new law also provides support to upgrade upgrading and transforming industries and SMEs, expand public transportation subsidies, set up measures to attract foreign tourists to Taiwan, and strengthen agricultural infrastructure. These efforts aim to ensure growth momentum and maintaining the resilience of industrial development. National resilience is composed of a wide range of elements. It is only by identifying issues and challenges faced by the country and demonstrating executive and governance capabilities can national resilience be effectively strengthened and accumulated. 
Taiwan, for example, as a country that is highly integrated into the international economic system, must attend to strengthening national security and upholding regional stability and peace, while also maintaining constant effort to reform and optimize conditions in the realm of its economy, society, and environment. Only thus can the resilience and resistance of the nation be enhanced. Innovation is the driving force of Taiwan's economic growth and is a key factor in industrial transformation and upgrading. Faced with the rapid evolution of digital technology, Taiwan must continuously strengthen its own innovation capability and make every effort to integrate with the world in order to secure its key position in global supply chain and thereby bolster its economic resilience. In terms of industrial innovation and transformation, the government has been promoting sixth core strategic industry, given active support to the development of the information and digital industry, the cybersecurity industry, the precision health industry, national defense and strategic industry, the green and renewable energy industry, and strategic stockpile industries. Support is particularly targeted at maintaining te technical leadership deploying forward-looking application and ensuring the supply of key materials to consolidate Taiwan's key leading position in the world's technology sector. To tap into the major trend of global supply chain restructuring, the government is also working hard to improve the investment environment, hoping to make invest in Taiwan a prime choice of global corporate in deployment. Measures introduced under the three major programs for investing in Taiwan aim at attracting overseas Taiwanese business to bring investment back to Taiwan and encouraging domestic businesses to expand investment have so far helped raise the investment in Taiwan to an accumulative total of more than two trillion NT dollars, bringing more than 145,000 job opportunities. In addition, we also have been doing our best to enhance the global attractiveness of Taiwan's investment environment. Last year, the amount of overseas Taiwanese and foreign investment in Taiwan exceeded 13.3 billion US dollars, an increase of 78% over the previous year. This is the clearest possible proof that international investors have a high degree of confidence in Taiwan. In terms of expanding supply chain globalization, on the one hand, we have continued to assist enterprises to grasp the opportunity of global supply chain restructuring and pursue global strategic deployment to avoid the risks of over-reliance on a single market. While on the other hand, we have actively collaborated with like-minded partners to build a resilient supply chain system. Taiwan and the United States, for example, have focused on collaboration in key industries such as semiconductors, 5Gs, electric vehicles, conducted through dialogues such as the Taiwan-U.S. Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, the Taiwan-U.S. Economic Prosperity Partnership Dialogue, and the Taiwan-U.S. Dialogue Economic Forum. Meanwhile, Taiwan and the U.S. have concluded the first round of negotiation for the Taiwan-U.S. 21st Century Trade Initiative to strengthen bilateral trade and investment and enhance market economy and international linkage. In recent years, Taiwan's relations with Europe have been greatly strengthened. 
our government has launched the plan to strengthen linkage with Europe aimed at the deepening uh, cooperation with Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Lithuania, and other Central and Eastern European countries that share values of freedom, democracy, and human rights, combining our respective advantages in trade and industry to jointly build resilient democratic supply system. Furthermore, the government has also been implementing the new Southbound policy to promote economic, trade, and industrial cooperation with the ASEAN, uh, South Asia, New Zealand, Australia, and other countries. Under this policy, we have been utilizing Taiwan's advantages to establish a platform of helping our countries link uh, our industries, a link into the supply chain of targeted countries, for in instance, by facilitating the export of smart city system integration solution under the Asian Silicon Valley Development Program. With regard to this uh, social resilience, uh, an aging population and low birth rate are common problems faced by many countries in Asia and Europe, with long-term implication for national resilience. Taiwan is addressing these challenges through, the, through both democrat, uh, demographic policies and improving manpower quality with the hope of being able to slow or even reverse the trend of manpower shortage. In terms of population policy, we have actively strengthened child care services, promoted the policy to support families to raise children from birth through the age of six, continue to implement a set of measures to counter the fall in fertility rate. We have greatly increased the funding for these purposes, up from $15 billion in 2016 to more than $100 billion this year. The supply of uh, affordable child care services has been substantially expanded and amount of child care subsidies increased. These measures all support our aim of building a parenting friendly environment so that young people are more willing to have children. At the same time, we are aiming to create more friendly family-friendly workplace condition that allows a better balance between work and family to encourage women to take up jobs and increase the female labor participation rate. Furthermore, in order to enhance the quality of workforce and meet industrial demand for the talents, we must beef up efforts not only to develop domestic uh, talents, but also to attract professionals, talent, professional talents from worldwide. Toward this end, the government promulgated the Act for the Recruitment of Employment and Employment of Foreign Professionals, which substantially liberalized work and residence regulations for foreign professionals and optimized related taxation social security, and other benefits. Since this act came into effect, the number of foreign professionals employed in Taiwan has risen considerably up above 54,000 by the end of March this year. At the same time, the government has launched an initiative to enhance population and immigration policy, which includes the target of aiding 400,000 foreign professionals and mid-skilled technicians to the workforce between 2021 and 2030. Part of this increase is to be filled by a plan for a long-term retention of experienced migrant workers who qualified for reclassification as intermediate skilled manpower. In addition, the government is actively implementing the bilingual 2030 policy with the aim of equipping young people with abilities uh, as 
that are essential for being globally competitive so that they will be able to enjoy better career opportunities and the chance to earn the higher income. This bilingual policy will also be conducive to international enterprises depending their presence, uh, deepening their presence in Taiwan, help Taiwanese industry global deployment. With regard to the environmental resilience, the challenges of global warming is becoming increasingly severe, with extreme weather growing more frequent and causing major risk to global economic and social activities and to human life and safety. This has promoted more and more countries to propose carbon reduction targets and action plan for 2050. Although Taiwan is not a member of the United Nations and not a party to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, it has consistently fulfilled its responsibility as a member of the global village and has been actively promoting the transition to net zero emissions to build environmental resilience. In order to strengthen environmental resilience, President Tsai announced in 2021 that Taiwan is committed to achieving a net zero transition. And in 2022, the government published a plan for Taiwan's pathway to net zero emission in 2050, followed by an action plan setting out 12 key strategies for net zero emission. This February, the Climate Change Response Act came into force, making Taiwan one of the few countries in the Asian Pacific region to write net zero emission into law. For Taiwan, the net zero transition is not just an environmental conservation effort, but also a social transformation project aimed at coexisting peacefully with the Earth's ecology, turning conflicts and risks into opportunities. Therefore, the government specifically included just transition as one of the 12 key strategies for achieving net zero emission. This is to ensure that the net zero transition process adhere to the core value of leave no one behind and to strive for balance in policy objective, social equity, and inclusive stakeholder engagement. Additionally, to help SMEs pursue carbon reduction, the government is working hand in hand with industry associations and is setting an example through state-owned enterprises. These approaches adopted a large first small following and large leading small model, systemically promoting the transformation of SMEs to help them to cope with the carbon reduction demand coming from supply chains. In addition, the government is actively investing in the development of renewable energy. Last year, Taiwan's renewable energy generation reached 20 billion kilowatt hours accounting for 8% of total annual electricity production, marking a historic high. The share contributed by solar energy reached 2.5 gigawatt, the highest ever for a single year. And offshore wind power has also made significant progress with a cumulative installation of 191 offshore wind turbines this year, approximately 2.2 gigawatts of wind power from newly connected wind farm will be added to the grid. In the future, the government will continue to accelerate the development of green energy, ensuring stable power supply while addressing goals such as reducing air pollution and carbon emission. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented healthcare and economic crisis to the global community. However, crisis can be 
turning points, giving countries an opportunity for self-reflection. Now, all countries should make good use of the opportunity provided by the pandemic, adopt forward-looking and innovative thinking, and implement various arrangements for rebuilding national resilience. This includes promoting necessary structural reforms such as digital transformation and green transition to facilitate a strong post-pandemic recovery. The key strategy should revolve around promoting resources reallocation, building resilience, and ensuring a just transition. By reshaping the economic development model, we can enhance the long-term potential of our countries and advance toward a better and more sustainable future. Looking ahead, the development of global pandemic remained changeable and flawed with uncertainty, coupled with volatility of the geopolitical landscape. I sincerely hope that Countries in the Asian Pacific region will stay vigilant at all times and will steadily pursue resilience, growth, and development so that they will be best able to respond to whatever risk and shock may fall upon us in the future. Taiwan is very happy to share our experience in post-pandemic national resilience building with the global community. We also look forward to working together with like-minded international partners to achieve the goal of making the Asian Pacific a phoenix of resilience and to realize the vision of a prosperous Asian Pacific. Thank you. I wish you a very productive and inspiring meeting of minds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Chen, for those inspiring and optimistic words. And I now wish to invite back to the stage Malcolm Turnbull to respond and provide today's concluding remarks. Okay. Well, uh, Prime Minister, thank you so much for your, uh, for your speech. You know, it really was inspiring, uh, and the, your commitment to resilience, clearly influenced by Shirley Lin, uh, is paying <laughs> dividends for the people of Taiwan, you see? We, talk, we had a session earlier today talking about whether, how think tanks can be effective. And in fact, I think today we've seen a great example of that. The, uh, and, and we are, I hope you've been inspired by your Capri and your involvement with it and your founding of it, but also we are inspired by you. I was, uh, I was particularly uh, impressed, uh, and I say that in, in, the, you know, in the strict dictionary defini de definition of the word, really impressed by your policy on innovation and science and your commitment to that as a key driver of economic growth. It's very close to my heart. When I was PM in Australia, that was the first big economic policy I launched in 2015, an innovation and science agenda. And, and as you know, in Australia, we're big exporters of minerals and energy, and including to Taiwan. But I made the point then, and I think it's, I think it's still valid, that the only boom that you can be certain can continue forever is an ideas boom, because there is no limit on human ingenuity. I mean, you will run out of, you'll run out of minerals, or you'll certainly, you can run out of demand for certain minerals, but as long as people continue being in thoughtful, innovative, creative, you'll always have an ideas boom, and that is what Taiwan's success and economy is built upon now more than ever. In fact, in this country, and in fact, indeed, in this room, we're joined by some of the, the people who have actually founded, found builders of the modern digital economy. We heard from Stan Scher earlier. I mean, Stan, and we heard, we had from MK Tsai, 
earlier the founder of MediaTek, we've heard from Lynette Ng from TSMC. I mean, these companies, these creators, these engineers have built in large part the world, the modern digital world, uh, which we are living in and working with today. So it is a, uh, you know, Australians like to say, we always like to say we box above our weight. I don't think there's any country in the world that boxes more above its weight than Taiwan does. And I really salute you and just want to say how much I've enjoyed being here today or over the last few days, my first visit to Taiwan. I've been invited before and participated virtually because of the pandemic, but it's wonderful to be here in, uh, in future. Uh, your, uh, your remarks, your, your warning, I guess, your caution that we should be prepared for danger in times of peace is a very, very wise one, and everyone should take note of that. Uh, or as uh, Margaret Thatcher said, expect the unexpected. It's a, really the, uh, the, the one thing that you can be sure of is that you're going to be dealing with unpredictable challenges. I was really uh, impressed too by what you were saying about demography uh, and your policies to provide a, a more affordable and wider access to childcare. That was a feature, in fact, every single Australian government, including mine, has increased access uh, to childcare. It is, uh, it's, a, it's a reality that those societies that have the most affordable childcare and the most flexible workplaces, family-friendly workplaces, have the highest birth rates. I mean, that is why it seems like a paradox to many people, but the, in Europe, the, uh, the thoroughly secular Northern Europe with very generous childcare uh, services and a, and a flexible workplace culture has much higher birth rates than the more conservative and, if you like, religious uh, Southern Europe, like Spain, Italy, Greece, and so forth. So it is a, it re you're absolutely on the right track there, and your uh, policies are, are informed by global experience. So commend you on that. Um, I, I want to join Shirley in thanking all of the participants in the uh, discussions we've had today, whether we're talking about uh, the health uh, administration in Singapore, Hong Kong and Malaysia. It's been enormously insightful. Uh, the discussion, Chairman Lim's uh, very wise remarks about continuing education. I can understand why your cabinet submission uh, it wasn't very well received. You, you weren't here for this, I think. Mr. Prime Minister, but uh, Chairman Lim said that he, years ago, he had uh, been asked to do some work on continuing education, and they'd concluded that to do it properly, the government would need to spend every year uh, for every person about as third, as much, as, as a third as much as what they were spent on them when they were actually students, school students. And so you didn't need to have a, um, you know, a computer, uh, or you could even do the maths on your fingers. Uh, you can just imagine the cabinet ministers thinking, gosh, what's that going to cost? And what's that? <laughs> turning, turning pale. I've had a few discussions like that myself. I know the feeling, but anyway, but you're right. You're fundamentally right. And again, this is all part of the challenge of resilience, because the, the point being that we don't know what the future holds. Uh, it, is, it's liter it is literally unpredictable. Uh, and what we have to build into our societies and our businesses and our countries is the flexibility that comes from having optionality. Because we literally don't know which way to jump. We've got to make volatility our friend. That's, that, that, that's the reality. We've got, to, we've got to be, I always, when I used to talk about this in Australia, coming from a surfing nation, I used to say that, you know, we've got to, we've got, we can't be like King Canute who tries to turn back the waves. We've got to be like a really good surfer who sees a big wave coming and works out how to catch it and ride it uh, into, into the beach. So that's the key. Resilience is the key. That's been the focus of our discussions. I think it's been a very, very uh, positive and creative discussion today. I believe that the foundation of Capri in Taiwan is of enormous importance. 
I think Taiwan's experience is of immense importance in our region. I think we talk a lot about Taiwan, if I may say so, but we don't hear enough from Taiwan. And I think CAPRI's ability to share and integrate Taiwan's experience, which is remarkable, it's an experience, remarkable success in very difficult circumstances, I think that is going to be of a great benefit to the rest of us in the region. So thank you, Prime Minister, and thank you, Shirley, and thank you all the participants. It's been a really great conference, and I've been so delighted to have been here today and had the honour of uh, uh, opening and closing uh, today's proceedings. Thank you very much.